How's it going? Going well. Um, so I want to start with the psychedelics essay and then we'll move into Jacques. Um, and I wanted to start talking about psychedelics by asking you about your first psychedelic experience. I would love to hear about that. Hmm. Well, I won't count cannabis just because sometimes it can be psychedelic, but um, my first proper psychedelic experience was when I was 19, I tried, uh, I think probably about three and a half grams of psilocybin mushrooms. And I had been reading a lot about what to expect from such um, an experience, a lot of Terrence McKenna mm -hmm. and um, had already been familiar with these, the Harvard psilocybin project that Tim Leary and Richard Albert and Ralph Metzner had uh, set up in, in the sixties. And so I was primed, um, <clears throat> but the experience ended up being kind of surprising for me. I was more or less um, identified as a Buddhist at the time and had a meditation practice and um, was expecting, you know, some kind of, non non dual um, awakening of some sort with maybe some psychedelic visuals but uh, about 45 minutes after ingesting uh, the mushrooms I began to encounter um, a, a being that um, felt to me to be the Christ archetype let's call it which I say is surprising because I had definitely, my conscious mind had run as far as I could from um, Christianity at that time. And this, I wasn't aware of the esoteric side of, of um, or mystical side of Christianity really, and had just really turned to the East for um, spirit, spiritual nourishment. But basically it was this experience of feeling like um, my own, face uh, or countenance had been somewhat inhabited by this this Christ figure. And I was writing in my journal for most of the experience, but it felt as though like the Logos was writing through me. And so what I was writing in the journal, though from the outside, it was me writing it from my point of view, it felt as though I it was being written through me and I was being communicated to buy this by the logos um, through my writing. And so I would, something would get written on the page and then I would read it and then have that moment of recognition. And so, you know, the lived experience of it was this sense of inner light and warmth and love and recognizing this sense of higher self as a kind of Christ being that's not mine or anyone else's, but um, co-present, in everyone a layer deeper than our several layers deeper perhaps than our normal normal waking egoic consciousness and so you know i had maybe an hour and a half or so of this like deep communion with this being and then things shifted uh and it became a little bit more playful and and goofy and um i started to get quite um i was by myself in my room um in the evening time and just quite um, talkative. And I was like, just playing with my voice and making all sorts of silly jokes and um, cracking myself up. And, um, and yeah, so it kind of had a, a more um, lighthearted mm -hmm. ending. But um, that was a life changing moment for me. Um, I mean, I didn't convert or anything, but I definitely realized I needed to look more deeply at this um, biblical um lineage that i because of just you know the way that um my parents were in relationship um you know my dad being a kind of jewish atheist and my mom very kind of um fundamentalist i would say uh, i just ran away from that tradition and i had to over the, the last you know a couple of decades re rediscover the deeper um, mystical, esoteric, um, 
paths that have always been there, but we don't usually hear about. Um, so you'd run from Christianity at that point. You were identifying as a Buddhist. What was it about this being that you came into contact with that felt more Christ-like than Buddha-like? Uh, it was this, you know, part of the message being conveyed to me was the sense that um, the importance of incarnation, of being embodied, and, you know, I don't mean to to say anything um, negative or be dismissive of Buddhism at all. It was the more Americanized form of Buddhism that I had been imbibing um, that led me to feel like the path to the uh, being released from suffering and rebirth and samsara was to like dissolve the self right. um, and become less and less attached to anything in the everyday world. And so, you know, at the time before this experience, I would say I was maybe not clinically depressed, but I was kind of down. I was feeling increasingly um, disconnected from friends and not motivated by the same sorts of things that college guys are motivated by and was feeling um yeah almost like the beginnings of derealization mm -hmm. like all of these people and, and being judgmental of people who are you know more interested in um girls and drinking and uh football or whatever and i was feeling kind of high and mighty like i can see through all those illusions and you know i'm going to attain enlightenment by meditating and smoking pot and um, so this experience made me realize that, oh, actually selfhood, there is a higher type of capital S self that requires a bit more engagement in the world, engagement with other people, being less um, escapist. And again, I'm not saying that Buddhism is any of these things, uh, but the way I was practicing it was leading me in that direction. And I, you know, I can say I've seen other Americans, Westerners sort of adopt this approach to what they call Buddhism. And I, I find it maybe um, unhelpful. And so this reoriented me, brought me more into the world. It gave me a sense of this more incarnational spirituality, for lack of a better mm -hmm. term, and the importance of, of love and perceiving death as a, a kind of portal into deeper forms of love, like the, the core of the message that seemed to be um, communicated to me was that if we can love one another despite death despite my own death despite everyone's death of their physical body mm -hmm. then that's that's a pathway into spirit into spiritual realization that actually death is not the end but the death is the means through which we come into contact with this this deeper cosmic love Mm -hmm. um, which I, this all to me is, is is well characterized by like the term Christ consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Buddha consciousness, um, Buddha nature might be analogous in some ways, especially when you start to think about like, not just withdrawing from samsara and dissolving into the sense of, of non-self and non-attachment, but the the return move of the bodhisattva's vow to come back and assist all sentient beings until suffering is completely eliminated. That's more of that incarnational vector that I think is front and center in, um, in the Christ archetype and in like Mahayana Buddhism, it's, it's more front and center too. And so, you know, as I came to study more, um, I could see the parallels in how Buddhism itself developed that brought it closer to, you know, what this, um, Christ experience conveyed to me. Mm. Yeah, I've thought before that Christ was essentially a persecuted Buddha, that if the Buddha story included a portion of it where mm -hmm. uh, an empire had decided he was corrupting everyone and wanted to kill him and he was willing to die for his beliefs, it'd be very difficult, uh, you know, in a first pass reading to distinguish between what the two figures represented. So a lot of what you're describing as the insights you had on your first psychedelic experience are not dissimilar from where it, it feels like you are now. I mean, you have a lot more knowledge 
um, about world history and the history of philosophy than you had then, I, I know. Um, but would you say in some sense the core insight you had in that experience never left you or at the very least remained a guidepost, something you knew was there? And did you feel in your first experience during it that you'd had a revelation of a magnitude that couldn't possibly dissipate in a few hours to you know and and were you surprised to the degree to which you were returned to a state of concern similar to before the experience or um did it stay pretty steady for you it's been pretty enduring um for decades now as a touch point for me and a moment of of transition for me on this on my spiritual path where um i from that point forward just had this sense of um abiding love not just sort of love that i was able to actively um share with others but love that uh, love for love that the universe or the divine or or Christ has for me. I mean, I'm almost kind of embarrassed because I don't want to sound um, evangelical or anything. And I'm 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 actually a committed pluralist on these sorts of deep questions. Um, but you know, for me personally, this experience dissolved any sense of like existential fear that I might have about. Um, death or um, about uh, the ultimate uh, destiny of uh, or destination of my soul or you know these it, it it's not that it answered um, my metaphysical questions but it it gave a certain um, sense of security about the uh, nature of um, the answer to questions that I continue to ask. Like I can just feel the, um, the but that my my lure to no answers to like philosophical questions is like steeped in this sense of love and compassion and um, um, yeah, I, I don't know how else to describe it than than love. Um, and you know it's it's a cliche right love is the answer love is the meaning of life uh and it's having an experience like this it's quite ineffable and um strange and again surprising even to myself and so you know i'm i'm perfectly open to talk about it and um people ask me about it from time to time and uh but i also i can't help but feel a bit of embarrassment around it just because the attempt to describe it never quite does justice to how it felt in the moment, you know? So, yeah. um, so that, that brings me to something from the essay. Um, Might the future of religion resemble its psychedelic past? In an off-cited paper, Huston Smith took religious leaders and scholars to task for ignoring or dismissing the relevance of psychedelics. He argued forcefully, no doubt motivated in part by his own life-changing experience in Marsh Chapel a few years earlier, that psychedelics, quote, have light to throw on the history of religion, the phenomenology of religion, the philosophy of religion, and the practice of religious life itself. So, you know, when he said that psychedelics have light to throw on the history of religion. I, I, I've certainly also had psychedelic experiences where the feeling was that this must be the experience um, that be began religion. Um, this, this has to be what is being gestured toward. Um, and I know that, of course, psychoactive substances have been used in rituals and religious rites all through human history. Um, but what I wonder is, were there periods and circumstances in history, do you believe, um, in which 
experiences of this sort, which for us pretty unequivocally tends to require some chemical stimulus. Were, were these states that were more readily accessible in the waking consciousness of people during epochs where religion was more fully believed in with the whole body? Um, or do you think it's for the most part always been a relationship between human beings and parts of the natural world that we come into contact with that elicit this for us and give us a peak that then we do our best to bring back into a, a state that's more socially determined and pulls from more base instincts. I wouldn't want to be a psychedelic reductionist, which would mean that all of religion is explainable in terms of the alteration of consciousness through some chemical, ingesting some chemical um, or plant or fungi. But clearly there's more and more evidence, archeological evidence every day that, that these sorts of um, practices go way back in history and prehistory and uh, it's present on every continent. And so it's clearly quite widespread. Um, but I do think that the whole idea of like belief being the, um, what's essential to religion, um, which is a category, you know, kind of invented by European anthropologists. Um, the idea of belief as something cognitive, I think is a rather modern way of framing what religion is all about. You said I like the way you framed it though, belief that's got a bodily basis. It's like bodily belief. It's not cognitive. It's rooted in practices of um, mimesis and, and ritual and dance and um, belief might not even be the right word. It's more like an enactment of, 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 a, of a religious reality that wouldn't, it wouldn't have even occurred to people even in the medieval era in Europe, much less um, in the, you know, prehistoric um, in the Paleolithic and, and for much of the Neolithic, it wouldn't have even occurred to people that they might disbelieve in these um, powers, non, non-human intelligences and agencies that, that inhabit and make up the world around them. And, you know, there are so many ritual means of altering consciousness that some do involve substances, others don't. And I think, you know, at some point along the line, like we discussed when we were talking about Whitehead's religion in the making in the effort to reproduce emotions, um, different cultures developed um, rituals, which might just involve dance. And I mean, you can very easily get into a kind of trance state of altered consciousness just by drumming. Um, you don't need to take any any psychedelics, but you know plenty of also plenty of other cultures also introduced um, psychedelic substances as part of these rituals, and so um, I don't think they're required, but they're pretty prevalent, um, and so I think once once it became once one, once the shamans uh, and, and the, the spiritual leaders of different communities recognized the power of various concoctions to elicit these sorts of experiences, um, then it does become part and par parcel of the religious experience. And in some ways, the Eucharist, which isn't the invention, that ritual isn't the invention of the Catholic Church. It goes way, way back. Um, into prior sort of fertility cults and 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 rituals around um, agriculture and the way in which plants are they die and are reborn um, every year and you know the Catholic Church picked that up and and gave it a Christian spin um, but they only used wine and eventually not even it used to be psychedelic wine apparently as some research is showing and in a lot of um, Protestant churches, they don't even, they use grape juice, you know? And so there's this gradual um, distancing from the alteration and the emotion and the vision 
the visionary experience that would, would be produced by these sorts of rituals to just the ascent to a certain formulation, a dogma uh, that that you um, that you utter and a proposition that you say you believe in or multiple propositions. And so in some sense, what's left at this point in you know much religion in the modern world is just this dried out husk uh, of you know reciting empty words. And, and that's unfortunate. So I, I do hope that, um, that the rebirth, the renaissance of um, interest in psychedelics that's currently underway is more than just a clinical and medical and recreational thing, that, but that it also does influence the, the major world religions to rediscover the experiential basis of, um, of their key symbols and ideals, right? And I think that's as I explore in that paper, starting to happen. Um, mm. Hasn't caught fire yet, but it's starting. Have you had experiences? Well, with ayahuasca, have you had a different flavor of psychedelic experience in, in uh, you know, where the plurality element may be felt more immediate? Um, because that... Uh, Again, words can never do justice to these sorts of experiences. So, you know, we both know that out of the gate. Um, but mm -hmm. I, I will say that when I sat for an ayahuasca ceremony um, in Peru, where the shamans believe that you're, you're entering a realm where there are many different autonomous entities operating um that you know wh whether it's the suggestion from them or something about the nature of the compound i'm sure it's some combination of both you know I, i've i've experienced that that feeling before uh of of being not just in the presence of the the great divine one but um in the in the midst of many different autonomous energies that were at odds with one another and uh, you know upon some consideration when you're in the middle of a rainforest what is a rainforest right it's it's all these different autonomous entities eating each other and and breeding and dying and being reborn in other forms um so in some sense, yeah, when, when talking about, you know, the possibility that the spiritual realm is comprised of many entities, you know, it, it's strange to even divide it from the physical location where you're you're sitting at that moment. I mean, you're in a rainforest, you're surrounded by strange forms of life that you're unfamiliar with, that have intelligences of a kind that you're not used to interfacing with, but you're ingesting uh a portion of the jungle itself you you are actually deciding to make part of your body the jungle and of course that then uh you know ha has the potential to tune you into this this uh this other realm and whether you know it's just the energetic counterpart to the physical environment that you're inhabiting so yeah was ayahuasca different for you than any experience you'd had on mushrooms or did it feel to did it feel like it delivered you to a similar space um it's definitely different ayahuasca is quite um unique and i should say also that subsequent experiences with psilocybin didn't lead to a encounter with the, the christ um in the way that that first one did but ayahuasca for me has had this more um the quality of a of a teacher and a healer definitely but more um more organic i mean it really does feel like the spirit of the vine and it's this kind of I, i've had visual encounters um visions of a kind of pervasive feminine intelligence like this many armed goddess figure not like in a hindu sense um, but in a like like many vines and leaves like sort of growing off of this this feminine intelligence that was just showering me with compassion and love and 
um, it can be very somatic too. So there's a the visual experience, but then like feeling, I don't know, subtle f fluids just shooting around in my abdomen. And, and I've had experiences of um, my, my hands sort of forming these different mudras up and down um, my spinal column as if like doing some kind of subtle energy surgery or something. Um, and it feels like there is a definite, um, you know, Sheldrake would call it like a kind of morphic field or just this, this, this memory or this intelligence that's in this vine that's been used by, you know, South American peoples for, I don't know how many thousands of years. Uh, it has its own unique personality and it definitely has its own kind of agency. And I get that a little bit with mushrooms too, though somewhat less um, that the personality of psilocybin is a little bit less um, front and center than with ayahuasca, where it very much feels like, oh, there she is again. <laughs> and then like, if we continue on that same spectrum, like LSD, there's almost no um, morphic field there that as if it has its own personality or soul or something if lsd feels very much like it's all me in a way i don't just mean my ego but like i'm the one in the driver's seat here and it's like a blank canvas for whatever i want to throw on it um which makes sense given how recently it was you know chemically synthesized um even though people say ergot fungus that's quite chemically similar may have been used um in ancient Greece and whatnot, but the exact chemical LSD twenty five seems rather new, right? Yeah, LSD feels like we've we've hacked something that reveals a code that then we get to decide what to do with. It doesn't feel like a, an experience that's always been waiting for us. It doesn't feel as inevitable in some sense to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I, has. What was inflation an issue for you early on where you returned from? Because it sounds like just based on marijuana and meditation prior to that first mushroom experience, you'd got you'd inflated to, you know, in a certain way mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, sometimes maybe there were feelings of isolation. But overall, there was a sense that I've um, I've come to some truth that makes me superior to the people around me. Um, did you have any of that to, to an even greater degree after mushrooms? I mean, you know, 19, it's difficult to, <laughs> to not. It was a humbling experience actually. Um, and I would say if I had, the, there, there was some sense of a superiority complex before that, um, but it was a kind of sad superiority. I wasn't exactly, I didn't have much self-esteem, <laughs> um, but I definitely did gain more self-esteem and like just love and, and the ability to forgive myself for all my inadequacies after that first mushroom experience. Um, but I think it actually made me more, it gave me more humility um, because I, I could just, as much as I value like intelligence and insight and the ability to articulate myself and, and, you know, acquire knowledge and everything, all of that um, intellectual stuff just pales in comparison to the, the insight that I was given in that, that moment. And, you know, I've since come to study anthroposophy and Steiner's view. And, you know, from his point of view, like anything that we learn intellectually and all of our brilliant ideas and stuff when we die we don't take any of that with us mm. that's that's not that's not what what's core to our um our eye or or our higher self it has more to do with um our virtues our emotional um maturity and 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 capacity to to feel our feelings and to be with others and um you know that's where our self is 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 shaped and where karma happens. And so I still, you know, I love the life of the mind and it's, it's such a big part of who I am in this incarnation, but it, it, it's become, um, since that experience and what that experience opened for me, um, that source, that, that kind of, um, potential, like feeling of intellectual superiority or something has kind of 
gone away because yeah it feels less spiritually significant um you wrote something in relation to bad trips from a buddhist viewpoint the fear and paranoia that can attend psychedelic experiences may be related to the human tendency to anxiously grasp after an abiding self or sense of stable identity in the midst of a reality of endless process interdependence and impermanence as many buddhist practitioners have noted confronting such ruptures in our normal sense of selfhood that is quote becoming undone and being in between can serve as potent instruments for moral psychological and spiritual transformation yeah the be the being in between i've i noted my struggle with inflation when I, i've experimented with psychedelics and it, it's linked to a paradox um where yeah, you know, I think even a, after after my very first mushroom experience, um, which had had a lot of those feelings of interconnectedness and love, but I I I was also nineteen. I had just dropped out of college and moved to LA, and I was with a friend, and we and we were both um, in a headspace where, you know, we're looking at this new landscape and thinking about how we're gonna climb to the top and and win, and. Um, it, there, there was a brief period of, of wonder and connectedness at the beginning. And then our conversation just gradually took us to how we were go going to use this new insight we had. We were going to use it. We were going to pump it into our creative projects. We were going to talk about it in a way that was going to bring people to us. Um, and... It, it, it didn't take long after that first experience, especially because my friend, he continued doing it almost constantly. He's, mm -hmm. he's a, a brilliant guy, um, you know, had had just graduated from Harvard and, and was um, was incredibly bright. Uh, and, and he he believed he had control over it. He just he just kept taking them. And his grandiosity was then very clear to me, and I could immediately see, oh, that's that's what we were doing in that first trip. We were we were using it to. I can see it now. And so then, down the line a bit more, when I returned to it, I I had in mind the intention to not inflate, to not try to use this, to not bend it to my own narcissistic ends. Um, that this was uh, this was me turning away from the hyper capitalist competitive narcissism of everywhere, but Los Angeles in particular, and, and, and diving into a selfless place. But that intention, the intention to not inflate, um, I, I felt sort of collapsed on itself because. The moment I'd have a thought like I've done it, I've 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 successfully not inflated. I'm in a state where you know I'm I'm seeing that being of service is the ultimate virtue, and I'm thinking about ways I'm going to be of service. That it was almost unavoidable that whatever I was thinking about would would gradually take a shape in which I was exalted. I was I was special. I had attained a quality that now set me apart. Um and you know then I decided okay well I I have to just embrace that and like let let that part of the process happen, right? Because if I if I'm fighting it, then I'm I, it becomes another version of itself because I'm I'm measuring have I successfully conquered the ego or not. So let me just let this happen, and maybe embracing it is a version of letting it go, and that has proven for me the most dangerous path is, is where you've decided a a full embrace. You're so frustrated with trying to get around this element of yourself that feels fixed that you decide okay I, I transcend it by a full embrace I'll, I'll go through it um 
and and be completely unashamed of this sense that I have something that others don't, a sort of energy or vitality or insight or all of them put together that, uh, and having read a lot of Nietzsche and we talked about in our last conversation, how Steiner had um, praised Nietzsche as in a sense being the, le the least egotistical of the philosophers because he was owning it as a surge of his own vitality rather than claiming to have been granted timeless ultimate insight. And it, it, that's a version of what I'm talking about, where if, you know, that that idea that Nietzsche's the least egotistical because he just said, why even resist it on me and then hear me roar? Uh, <laughs> that's that's the complex. Um, and I think the, the value in it for me, um, this this last go around that full embrace, the danger manifested in, in a newly obvious way, um, where I got such a, I got such a clear sense that I had ruptured the harmony in my immediate um, surroundings. Yeah. Uh, in th that it hurt. It just, it was painful. It was painful enough um, to make me, to force me into recognition of the, the consequence of that way of approaching creativity, of, of just approaching life generally. Um, I think it, it, in prior instances, the only, I, I, the consequence had only felt like it, it, it was hard to stay that confident, but the artifacts of the, of the great wave, I, I was normally proud of in some way, um, I, you know, cause I, I was so just focused on getting to new places musically and um, as a writer and things like that. And um, I'd come away with things that, would normally get some different reaction. People like, whoa, there's something, there's something to this one that wasn't in the last one. So I'd be like, okay, mission accomplished. But yeah, I think I, I had to suffer. I had to suffer quite a bit uh, in order for the reality to be made clear to me. And, and maybe for some people, that's the only way. T to circle all, all of this back to the quote I read about bad trips um, and that, you know, that grasping for an abiding self, we, that, that's the other side of it, right? There's the, there's the, there's the trip that's great for you and bad for the people around you because you've, you've solidified to a point where like, no, I'm not this, this thing, I, I'm a thing, I'm a separate thing and I'm full of juice. <laughs> um, and then it can go too extreme the other way where you have, where you have no sense that there's any separate self in a way that's alarming it, because you you can't even seem to finish a thought before the part of you that undercuts the logic of whatever it is you're thinking has already acted upon it. So it's just the, these half branches you keep cutting off and, and you're like, where am I? Um, and, you know, Buddhist practitioners, as you wrote, um, they, they, they suggest in some sense a, a, an embrace of being in between which is of course fundamental to process philosophy generally a, a way of seeing the in between um uh, and and the relationship between that and being the in between um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. say a little bit about being in between if you could well it's you know bardo when we talk about the bardos which from the Buddhist point of view is, is this transitional phase after death, um, where layers of your identity that your mistaken identity are peeled away. And, and, um, you begin the process of after dying, then rebirth, but Bardo is between this, right. And so it can be very disorienting. I think, you know, shamanic traditions would, would, articulate something similar in terms of the dismemberment process and you know that experience of one's own consciousness becoming fragmented 
um, where you're cutting off the branches before they finish growing of each thought. I mean, that can be terrifying for you when you're going through it and for the, those who might be witnessing it, um, cause it, it mimics insanity. And, um, you know, when psychedelics first came back onto the scene in, in the, in the modern world and the, in the West in, in the fifties and sixties, they thought psychedelics would be useful for precisely that reason to, so, so that, so that psychiatrists could understand the nature of the deranged mind. Um, they were called psychomimetics because they mimicked psychosis. Hmm. Uh, they're still sometimes referred to that way by the psychiatric um, establishment. So, you know, though that experience when held in the right context uh, of, you know, being a, sh a form of shamanic dismemberment um, or an, an encounter with the bardo um, in preparation for actually dying could be really beneficial but but it has to be held in the right container and very often you know it's not we, we we're we're not in the ritual uh we don't have the cultural containers to provide the immediate context wherein that can happen safely and then the integration process afterwards um you know all of these intense experiences are just uh, rushing back onto the scene in in a contemporary uh, cultural environment that's not prepared at all to to help people understand how to deal with the inflation um, or how to deal with the fragmentation, um, you know. So either extreme of this, I think we're we're needing to quickly develop the tools, and you know, it's encouraging to see psychology and psychiatry and the whole mental health um field begin to embrace these technologies uh to use the term broadly and jacques elul might not appreciate that but um but at the same time i worry about the over medicalization of all of this because the way we think about health um, whether mental or physiological in contemporary western society is i think um such a a shriveled narrow view of it like actually i've asked a lot of doctors and psychiatrists this question to like can you define health and they're like oh no that's subjective that's a value statement and like i thought what what's medicine about and it's you know it's more about treating disorders and pathologies and ailments and disease um it's sick care it's not health care um whereas i think with these substances and the experiences that they can provoke require of us is to have some telos some sense of um what a healthy human soul spirit mind looks like and if we're afraid to assert some kind of norm or ideal in that respect um we're going to be totally lost in trying to engage with these things we need yes but here's my yeah. question I, it it so, and, and this connects to Elul and his notion of the over application of, of technique, which is um, a, uh, like a method of behavior meant to maximize efficiency in a way that we can measure numerically. Um, and this idea that medicine falls victim to that and, and ends up ignoring th this, ineffable experiential component but it seems like we we can only quantify what we can quantify and and when things are, get labeled uh they they instantly lose whatever that ineffable quality of health deep in the spirit that we're pointing to they they lose their purchase on that right because we've now just pointed to a part we've called it a thing we've concretized it so it seems like wherever medicine is at any given moment um it it, it can never it can never get there um because if it names it and categorizes it and says it's a specific thing it it, it loses it and so do do we is it 
important to, in, in some sense, should we expect less of formal medicine and and perhaps not be uh, fixed on the idea that it, it can become more holistic it's we simply need to be more holistic and and be able to recognize what medicine is and what it isn't yeah i mean perhaps because on the one hand like i i wouldn't want medicine to get so distracted from healing the body that you know it was more concerned with just making sure that the soul was uh, on good terms with God before dying, because on the one hand, it's like a materialistic approach to healing is has gotten to this extreme now where we keep veg bodies alive in a vegetative state, you know, for quite a long time, when it's clear that the soul and I don't necessarily mean anything supernatural by that, I just mean like the person that we would be able to engage with and that could enjoy life is gone you know and sometimes there's locked in syndrome and we have tools to tell when oh actually the person is still awake in there um but you know often that's not the case and so there's a bit of a miss medicine can become a bit misguided when it doesn't think of the whole human being but only of the body right mm -hmm. and but maybe that's what what we want medicine for and we have spirituality and religion to to treat the, the suffering of souls um and and to tend to the uh long longer trajectory of um of spiritual life that that you know some people might be interested in in cultivating beyond just the death of this body so yeah i i hear what you're saying maybe we, we don't want medicine to um overstep its limited purview but at the same time even if we're just going to be treating bodies like what's a healthy body like give give us some sense yeah. for like how to keep a body healthy and don't just treat they don't just treat the body when something's gone wrong like how do we you know so so few doctors even care about diet I, it's, it's just anyways we don't want to get off on that tangent but um, well no it's interesting I, I so i was looking at heart anatomy the other day um and I'd never really looked at uh, a labeled picture of the heart before and had the functions described to me. You know, I, the, the idea that, um, you know, it's, uh, blood is, is moving oxygen around the body and uh, deoxygenated blood, it, it enters the right atrium and then goes down through a tunnel to the right ventricle, which then pumps the blood up through a pulmonary tube, pulmonary tube, the lungs and there's these the little air capsules that then there's an exchange between uh of oxygen for carbon dioxide and then that blood then drops into the the left atrium a big chamber and down to the left ventricle and the ventricle sends it out through the arteries to and i i would as I was, I was, as I was looking at this and reading about this, there'd be points in the process, like, okay, the oxygen, the oxygen is being delivered through the body because it powers the body, right? It powers the arteries and the organs. And so then I was actually using an AI for this. I was like, okay, what, what is it about oxygen that gives it the power to energize things? Like what is oxygen, you know, and the AI breaks it down into, uh, you know, the, the nature of the oxygen's electrons, you know, there's just now a smaller component uh, to which we're attributing and, and that part just does it. That's the part that just has the energy and this part delivers it. And on one level, it's it's easy to look at it and uh, and feel like yes, some, something's being missed here. Like this is you've just you've named these parts and you've you've decided this is doing this because that and ignoring the element uh of or the the degree to which that thing is is being powered by the very process that um you know, just the circular nature of all of it and how the the part that's being delivered cuz it has the real life thing in it seems somewhat you're you're saying it's oxygen 
So then we look at this whole thing as like, well, oxygen is where the life is. And so these are now all machines meant to get that vital uh, element where they need to be. Um, and, and maybe I'm wrong about this. It just, it seems like you could, you could decide it was electrons and then talk about oxygen as just another mechanism of delivery rather than the thing being delivered. Mm -hmm. um, and so on one level, it's easy to say, oh, they're, they're missing that, that holistic picture. On another level, they, it, there's the goal with heart uh, anatomy, as in the context I was reading, it was for EMTs, right, that are going to be showing up on the scene. They need to quickly figure out which type of shock is this? Is this cardiogenic? Is this a distributive shock? Is this a uh, hypovolemic shock? It, it, it and these these are uh, there's there's infinite variation i'm sure in in what we could consider shock but they've broken it down into a few categories so they can quickly uh help this person to not die in that moment and so you know it, it would be an example of uh of jacques Ellul's technique in in some sense where now we're understanding the body based on trying to become more efficient in a method that we can verify the validity of through numerical data. But the numerical data in this case would be how many people died versus how many didn't die. Um, and, and so, you know, in, in that case, it, it seems like the, a proper use of that mechanizing mind. Let's make the body into a machine for as long as we're quickly trying to stop a leak, you know, and like make the, the, the engine start up again. Let's think about it like a machine there. Um, and yeah, just, but ho hopefully we can stay cognizant that that's a utilitarian framework that we, we absolutely need, but not let it own us to the point where we're like fundamentally this body is a machine can be understood fully as a machine uh that the the danger is just that we live inside of it and so yeah this this is all touching on the idea that ra perhaps rather than railing against the the mechanized world and its application of technique and hoping that it it that a new holistic technique could be developed and applied, we have to see, no, the attempt will make whatever we do into further technique. Mm -hmm. The only way that we can have a conversation about the evidence that shows this is better than that is going to be numerical data. Um, and if we decide, no, it's got to be about that, that glow of health that you can't define, but you know it when you see it, like, well, that, that's going to have to stay in the experiential realm. We just have to let that inform us as we inevitably mechanize the world. Um, mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I, for acute pathology or injury or, um, you know, when, when something internal has gone wrong and if I don't have surgery, I'm going to die in a few days or immediately bring me to the hospital. Like I want allopathic medicine. I want them to get in there and fix the gears that have broke. <laughs> yep. Um, but if I'm trying to stay healthy, keep me away from the hospital. It's a very dangerous place to be. <laughs> I bet, I and bet. you know, the thing is like, I'm, I'm an organicist about the universe, about life, which is to say there's something more than mere mechanism at play. But the thing is, unlike a mechanist who would say, oh, there's nothing else. There's no or organic, organic magic going on. It's just a machine. As an organicist, I think self-organization and this kind of circular causality that you were pointing to in your account of the heart and um, how it energizes us, that is something non-mechanistic that cannot be explained in mechanistic terms. But I'm not denying, I, I wouldn't deny that there are um, subsets of of behavior and activity in the human body and in any organism that can be modeled mechanistically. Of course, it's just that organism is the more general category and mechanism is a subset of what organisms need to, to continue to do what they do. Whereas the mechanist is going to say, no, there is no other 
circular causality that's self-producing and um, that, that transcends mechanistic explanation. It's all just parts obeying rules that we can fully understand and measure and predict. Um, and so I think, you know, the organicist approach includes the mechanist approach. It's just not, mechanism isn't sufficient. It's part of the explanation. It in view as, as what it is. It's, a, it's an accessory. It's something we can aim and use. It doesn't wrap around us and then. Yeah, it can be a valid partial description of many processes, um, but never an explanation. Yeah. Um, and, and it can be valid as a diagnostic technique, you know, as EMTs find very useful to save lives. Like we wanna be able to understand what's broken down and intervene so as to keep that person alive. Um, we don't need to be doing metaphysics in those moments. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but you know, this is an example I think of where as important and powerful as someone like Jacques Ellul's critique of technological society is, I wouldn't want to go quite as far as him because I think that these sorts of um, diagnostic techniques, for example, are quite important and valuable. Um, yes. And I'm not as much of a technological determinist as he was um, because I think we still have our human freedom and imagination that can't ever be fully subsumed into any um, any machine, any any technique, right? Where we always have the ability to escape from that. And he would probably, I mean, he was still a Christian and had this transcendent orientation. I think that was really where he wanted to direct people is like, don't think the machines are going to save you. Like, um, we need to cultivate our spiritual connection to the divine um, if we want to maintain our sense of freedom and value and, and purpose in life. Um, but I'm, you know, he inspired the Unabomber, <laughs> right? And so it's, it's very easy for his critique of technological society to become a, um, to motivate violence to destroy the machine. And I think there were, Yeah, but it seemed like he was pretty careful to mm -hmm. not uh for, I, conflate he wasn't advocating machines violence. and sorry what well i just he wasn't advocating violence himself but he was interpreted that way by some yeah right but he wasn't even when he was talking about the technological society he wasn't just saying a, a society full of machines he was using that term technique and was constantly mm -hmm. saying uh i mean he even says that what he um we can even say that technique is characteristic of precisely that realm in which the machine itself can play no role. It is a radical error to think of technique and machine as interchangeable. And mm -hmm. his definition of technique is a little elusive, um, but he's like the, the machine is, is an embodied e expression of technique, but technique is Mm -hmm. it's, it's just an orientation toward provable communicable efficiency right um yeah and but he connects it to ancestral worship of the mysterious he says mm -hmm. how did man come to domesticate animals to choose certain plants to cultivate the motivating force we are told was religious and the first plants were cultivated with some magical end in mind. This is likely, but how was the selection made? And how did it happen that the majority of these plants were edible? How did man come to refine metals and make bronze? Was it chance, as the legend of the discovery of Phoenician glass has it? This is obviously not the answer. One is left with an enigma. And there is some point in emphasizing there is, he, there is here the same mysterious quality as in the appearance of life itself. Each primitive operation of man implies the bridging of such an enormous gulf between instinct and the technical act that a mystic aura hovers above all subsequent development. Our modern worship of technique derives from man's ancestral worship of the mysterious and marvelous character of his own handiwork. I, I like that because it 
you know, you, obviously the a, a purely mechanistic framework that claims to be explanatory feels like very far away from um, the the divine groundedness and experience. But the the idea that it, it sort of birthed out of a, a moment in the development of consciousness when we figured out we could change things. We could we could decide to look at something as a certain thing to meet our goal, deconstruct it, and something would actually work. This this capacity we had developed, we we could put it out there and affect things um that that we that there were laws that we could at least make the attempt to systematize and that th there's there's some th there's still a divine mystery uh being discovered there and appreciated and and participated in that that just forgets its origin um and, and you know he he also he said uh oh there's there's a quote i loved here um the technical operation includes every operation carried out in accordance with a certain method in order to attain a particular end it can be as rudimentary as splintering a flint or as complicated as programming an electronic brain in every case, it is the method which characterizes the operation. It may be more or less effective or more or less complex, but its nature is always the same. It is this which leads us to think that there is a continuity in technical operations and that only the great refinement resulting from scientific progress differentiates the modern technical operation from the primitive one. Every operation obviously entails a certain technique, even the gathering of fruit among primitive peoples, climbing the tree, picking the fruit as quickly and with as little effort as possible, distinguishing between the ripe and the unripe fruit, and so on. However, what characterizes technical action with a particular activity is the search for greater efficiency. Completely natural and spontaneous effort is replaced by a complex of acts designed to improve, say, the yield. It is this which prompts the creation of technical forms, starting from simple forms of activity. These technical forms are not necessarily more complicated than the spontaneous ones, but they are more efficient, better adapted. So here's the part. Thus, techniques cr create means, but the technical operation still occurs on the same level as that of the worker who does the work. The skilled worker, like the primitive huntsman, remains a technical operator. Their attitudes differ only to a small degree. So that that last image there, that the skilled worker, somebody working in, a, in an advanced civilization that's, you know, uh, 12 layers deep in techniques, uh, that they're still just carrying, the, at the human level, they're just carrying out some simple action, some simple day-to-day Thing that's not that much more complicated than what the primitive was doing and and that's what gives it the sense that so, something else has has taken over and encapsulated us that it, it's not that that this mm -hmm. we that this process of um discovering more efficient means it doesn't have as much to do with us. It has implications for us, of course, and affects everything around us. But the driving force behind it doesn't have us in mind because we're the we're not we're not basing our technique on what's rich about our experience, and then see, seeing that we magnify that and magnify that as our techniques uh, get more efficient for that sort of yield. Um, we simply find that we're, we're now rather than moving wood from here to there, you know, I'm, I'm moving code from here to there and, uh, and, and some, something else that the force that is animating all of the rapid changes doesn't have as much to do with me as it, it should, given that I'm the most conscious agent in the arena. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, this is the division of labor, right? And as 
civilization became more and more complicated and eventually the factory system is invented. I mean, Whitehead talks about the invention of the method of invention in the 19th century, uh, where there's a methodology created to um, make the discovery of new techniques and technologies more efficient. So there's mm -hmm. this, you know, recursive amping up that has occurred in the last few hundred years. And there are many downsides to the division of labor. I mean, in a typical factory scene, like each person is doing some little task that and they have no idea how it fits into the larger factory and, and what product is being produced by this company and so it can be alienating it can make the worker feel somewhat purposeless um that their work isn't actually that valuable because all i'm doing is connecting this doodad to that thing over there and and so that's um part of the dehumanization and the alienation that results from an increasingly um technologically driven society, but at the same time, um, you know, we're, because of the division of labor, you know, modern, uh, in our economy, we're, each of us is more dependent on other people than we've ever been before, just for our basic needs, you know, for food, for clothing, for shelter, for automobiles, like, we're all doing this little piece and less connected to the finished product than craftsmen in the middle ages or whatever. Um, but at the same time, at least in some circumstances, and I would hope that we're moving more and more in this direction, you know, each of us is doing less work, but getting more for it in a way because of the efficiency one as a result of the division of labor. And the problem is that, there's a in there's an economic injustice in the way that workers in different corporate firms are treated and they're not given insight into uh, what what the overall operation is about so that their role has meaning they're just told to do their job and so you know there are parts of this that are dehumanizing but on the other hand i don't want to just um totally mm -hmm demonize the the idea of like division of labor because i think it does afford us actually if we're if we become more conscious of everything that's involved um it it affords us a more interconnected society and a more um cooperative orientation that like we're all playing our little part in this much larger project now elul is right that there's a an arc to technological advance advancement that doesn't seem um at all um connected to or sensitive to human flourishing and human needs right it's like do we like you know the military industrial complex for example like we're we're investing probably more money than any other industry into creating ever more efficient killing machines right and that seems to have taken on a logic of its own just because it's so profitable and so those sorts of runaway curves of technological development are quite dangerous and may end up destroying us right and so i take Elul's warning seriously but um i also see and maybe he writes about this you know i haven't it's it's i haven't read um all of his work by any stretch and so maybe he sees the 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 upside uh, also in places, but um, I wouldn't want to just totally throw out the boons of technique and division of labor and so on. Yeah, nor would I, and I'm sure he does cover the other side. But a lot of what I was feeling while reading him, yeah, goes back to that idea that he's he, your there's a the complaint uh, that the uh, about what the mechanical um, way of viewing things and way of building things leaves out. But then in the characterization of that quality that's being left out, there tends to be an acknowledgement that it can never be fully put into words. And so it, it is the feeling that there's, there's something being asked for here that we want reflected by uh, technology and organization that it it might come from within more than mm -hmm. is generally acknowledged. It might, 
you know, it, it can be encouraged from the outside, but um, that ultimately there's no way medicine could present itself that would in any final way say we've we've figured out what you are and how best to serve you in, in the the deepest part of yourself you know and maybe the you know right now it, you tend to get one extreme or the other you know you go to a hospital and you feel like a machine and you go to an ayahuasca circle and you feel like there's there's something not quite solid enough about how you're being viewed um, and, and that your, your individuality and your status as a, as a creature is not being given its due reality. Um, and perhaps there is some, some happy medium we could aspire to, uh, but I think no matter how much more enlightened our systems become, they'll always leave that that big question mark that ha has to be there because they, they'll never tell us what we are uh, they they in any full way and however far they get it'll it'll further highlight how far they have to go it's like what verveki was talking about with how ai has the potential to make us ever more aware of um what it is that distinguishes us from machines. I think that however advanced our machines get, th that that will always, that edge will always exist where we say, yeah, but it doesn't, it can't, it's not quite, it's not quite reflecting back what I am. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the deeper, the deeper question here that Elul's work surfaces is to what extent are have we become so obsessed with the means and in increasing the efficiency of the means that we no, no longer even know what the end is? Mm -hmm. What is the end of human life? Mm -hmm. And technology has become a religion. Technological progress has become a religion. We Many people um, assume in so many ways that it is our savior. It will be our savior. It will literally get grant us immortality. Um, or right, but if you ask them, but wh where is it ultimately taking us? That question remains unanswered. But that that still connects to what I'm feeling. Where he's like, well, you know, this look, the, w w this technology, it doesn't even, uh, you know, it doesn't even take us. It, it doesn't even know where it's taking us. But then if you ask, well, where precisely should it take us, or, or wh where are where should we be going? Technology but, can't answer that for us. <laughs> I know, but I don't think it can be, it can be answered. And well, oh, that's what you're saying by saying technology can't answer that for us. Right, not that something else could, but that, right, to, of course technology can't. Um, yeah, the, the, the answer does get down to these more uh, white-headed notions of, of value, fe felt value, the achievement of, a state of being for its own sake. Um, so you could then imagine a, a direction of technology that is doing its best to take that notion of value into account, where we're, we're, it, we are going to use uh, machines and methodologies to try and stabilize and keep people in the, you know, the highest states of felt value that we can you know that that's paying proper attention to the needs of the human being to exalt that but then we find no we don't we don't want that that sounds like even if it was the most divine experience not purely hedonistic one of interconnectedness and love if if we felt that technology was just stabilizing us there there'd be something missing from it that we want we need we need this the sense that we're being challenged we're constantly having to overcome um and so yeah the the, the proper societal structure it it would have to include proper so you know I'm, i i mean i guess utopian j just to give some sort of picture of like what how, how what world could Elul be observing that would make him write a book about how incredibly we're handling our grasp of technique and technology? Mm -hmm. um, that 
that seems to be, and, and, and yeah, I haven't read enough of him yet to know if he gets there. And whenever someone does go there, it feels like they're building some unrealistic utopian vision. And oftentimes in philosophical writing, because the people are trying to avoid that, it it ends up being more poetic gestures toward, you know, the basic virtues that we could be keeping in mind more as as we move forward in developing our technology. And maybe that's the level of resolution that is is right, where we we acknowledge that the process of innovating technologically, it it is it it is going to get a little out of our control necessarily. I mean, he, he alludes to how the, the best scientist wa wants to be in the lab that will give him the best equipment to work with. So whatever the presuppositions or the, the method of inquiry that informed the construction of the highest end tools at any given time, which is often the military industrial complex that's drawing that efficiency out, then the best scientist feels like, well, in order to really contribute to be at the edge, I have to be using these tools and they they just continue whatever direction of inquiry was implicit in those tools. And before you know it, we're 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 following something and we're not quite sure where it goes. That that that's the inevitable nature of technological innovation. And and the best we can do is on a personal level cultivate these virtues and hope by osmosis that the, the, there's something about those feeling states that gets into the method of inquiry and, and redirects the, you know, the ever extending snake of progress. Yeah, I think that's, that's the best we could do. <laughs> uh, there is this, this, there is a runaway machine, you know, that's and not just, I know not just machines, but the techniques that go into uh, designing and, and motivating the production of uh, the machines, and it's it it has a it it appears to have um, an autonomy to it, right? And so we as human beings who are both the um, initiators of this process, but also increasingly the victims of it, I think need to take stock and just ask the basic question over and over again: Is this is this serving human flourishing? What human need is this meeting? Or is this just, um, you know, because we have a market algorithm running that's seeking profit as an end in itself. And so there's incentive to produce uh, technologies that, that are um, serving desires we didn't even know we had yet, right? And so are we, are we producing new human desires? And is that really what we want to be um, driving the technological advancement or do we want to produce uh, a, a machine system that's serving us that's making more room for us to be human right versus pulling our the lower and I, I don't I mean I have nothing against pleasure and and um, you know bodily joy and and um, using technology to make us comfortable and life convenient and stuff. But like what, if that's the end, um, the only end, and we don't have any sorts of spiritual ideals, we don't have any sense that death is um, a transition, a movement through the bardo into, you know, something else. And we're only trying to make the material conditions of life um, more glamorous and glitzy and efficient, then I think we're going to be losing what makes us human in this whole process. Mm. Mm. I think yeah. um, I think I'm gonna need to wrap up here in a few minutes, but I don't know if you wanna put a bow tie on that. <laughs> well, I wanna read one more thing from your psychedelics essay. Okay. I might mispronounce this Indian sage's name, but the eighth century Indian sage Padma Sambhava. Sambhava. Padma Sambhava, I think is how it's pronounced. Credited with bringing Buddhism to Tibet, 
had the following to say about death, which from a religious point of view may be the most pregnant moment in human life. Quote, at this time when the transitional process, the bardo, of dying is appearing to me, I shall abandon attachment, craving and grasping onto anything. Without wavering, I shall enter the experience of the clear practical instructions. I shall transfer my own unborn awareness to the absolute nature of space. I am about to be separated from the comp composite of my body of flesh and blood. Know that it is impermanent and illusory. So the, the moment of death I, I've, in various traditions, sometimes it seems like it, the, there's a test that happens yeah, there's some you there's a and then other times it's it's described as just something you simply must recognize in order to m move forward or or properly reincarnate um i i it's it's obviously in buddhism it's in hinduism it's in Christianity has less to do with the the moment of the I guess what you believed right prior to death in in many Christian uh, traditions, but others emphasize the kind of life lived prior to that more than anything. Um, and then, obviously, anthroposophical schools also emphasize that there's this there's a moment at, at, and there's there's some kind of action some spiritual act or recognition that that must take place in that moment and that will determine something about the quality of what follows mm -hmm. um you know it, and sometimes that's d described more naturalistically as a uh as, as a simple consequence of the state, like if you are failing to recognize that the bright lights are you, like in the book of the dead, you know, that that failure to properly recognize what you are versus what you are not is the same thing as incarnating into a lower state. It's not mm -hmm. a, a decree or a punishment, like you failed the test, therefore you now pay for it. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, do you, it, it, would you say the anthroposophical view has, which is the, the school of thought that Steiner carries forth, um, is there more of an emphasis on a, a required recognition and, and that state being indistinguishable from the quality of what follows or a, a moralistic decree um, that is brought down by some uh, an authority. Karma is not something that's done to you. It's your own action and the consequences of your own action. And I think the moment of death is, is described as a, again, a process, right. Of moving through this, life between death and a new birth, as Steiner likes to say, that's the bardo. And, you know, whether it's Steiner or different traditions, they describe something like a life review. And the idea here is that um, it's not that you are judged by some um, harsh father figure for all the wrong things you did. You actually relive your own life, but from the point of view of everybody that you affected. If you affected somebody negatively, you experience it. If you affected them positively, you re-experience it from their point of view, right? right. And so nobody's doing that to you. <laughs> you're well, that, 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 that quality of now you're going you're gonna to go back and you're going to feel what you did. Um, it it gives me that feeling of of a moral judgment and a sort of like no you're going to go look at it rather than that the the resonances of those experiences are are simply what you're made of at yeah. the end um and and have their have their consequence in the next moment of the process rather than that 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 rewind 
it's gives like a, that moralistic tinge. I could see that. Yeah, it's a process of uh, moral digestion, I would say, like um, digesting the uh, karmic deeds, which do accumulate through the course of your life. And in that moment, you have to to be released from that. Um, there, there's still a process of metabolization, which needs to occur. And I mean, the, the, the deeper insight here is that we're not separate beings, you know, karma is ultimately, it's not mine or yours. It's, it's this in between thing, um, whereby we, we're always creating one another or destroying one another as a result of the actions that we take. And yes, we have freedom in the actions that we take, but, you know, in the life between birth and death, when we're incarnated, we we feel quite um, distinct and individuated and feels like things happen to me, things happen to you. And um, I take responsibility for myself and vice versa. And that's not an illusion. It's but it's a phase in the process. And when we get the full circle of the life, death, rebirth mystery in view, then that individuated um, phase needs to be um, integrated with the uh the more um enmeshed inter penetrating um phase where you know it's not that i'm doing anything to you or you're doing anything to me we're going through this process of spiritual growth where for a part of that process we need to feel separate and and so who's judging who um becomes a difficult, if not impossible, kind of question to answer. It might not be, I don't want to say it's not the right way of framing it, but it, because I can totally understand why it would feel like still this form of um, the scales being weighed. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, but it's, it's like you doing it to yourself, you know, ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's how I view it. I, I guess I just tend ten toward a view that the consequence is baked in. I mean, I read this book a while back, The Anatomy of Evil, and it was hmm. uh, not a particularly philosophical book. It, it more like just a, account after account of the worst things you've ever imagined. And this guy creating a hierarchy of the kinds of evil and like, you know, the, the most evil, of course, being creative torture for pleasure right and it it really had a a particular chapter really had a hold on me for a long time it was the, the description of something that i i couldn't quite integrate just a, you know I, yeah. I won't go into too many specifics but yeah you know a, a serial killer who would kidnap people and, and keep them in a terrible place for long periods of time and subject them to all kinds of horrific pain for no purpose other than him enjoying it. Uh, and I was like, could, could he like, what, what, what we're looking at with someone like that, like the, when they're enjoying torturing someone, I remember talking to a friend about it and he, and, and he, he was saying, you know, just, but just imagine how, how small you'd have to be like, and feel in order to ha have so little recognition of what connects you to this person in front of you that j the, the, the most enjoyment uh, from this life you can think to glean is is just from like feeling yourself powerful because you're you're eliciting some big terrible reaction from this per that you're in you're in hell at that moment you're 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 burning in that moment um and the when when I when I go to the idea there's something so tempting to me about the idea that like well when that guy dies you know 
in that case, he's now going to be tortured, right? It's not just like, hey, you made someone feel bad in that moment. Now you have to feel how, you know, your narcissism rubbed off. It's like, no, you, you know, you burned someone a lot. Now you burn. You feel it so you know. Um, that it, 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 yeah, it, it's, it's, it's satisfying in a certain way, but feels circular to me at, at the same time. And there's, there's something in me that wants to move toward the, the consequence being in, in the action. Um, mm -hmm. And that the, the, the karma pl plays out. It, it, it doesn't require some objective record keeping in, in like the, the visual sphere, like that record is, I mean, in some ways it feels that that view, that anthroposophical uh, framing of um, death and the karmic process, I, I, I remember I connected it in a certain way to Whitehead before, um, you know, given imagining it's a return to God and, and, and white has notion of a dipolar God who uh, his um, mental pole is, is primary. And I just thought of that, that flip and Steiner's view of, you know, you go through life and then you like go back through it. Um, that, that, you know, is like a return to white has God in a way, but it, it, in a, from another view, they feel very opposed to me, whereas like, because so much of what I get from Whitehead is, is the idea that the 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 past is is ever present. It's it's what every moment is made of, um, and the objective immortality of it, does, it, it isn't in some perfectly preserved record of every resonance in each moment. That that record is what we're doing now that the the record is is forever this moment and this moment and this moment and yeah that this when when steiner take takes me out of that organic procession and and we're navigating in this other way um it set yes yeah, i i maybe sets off the the little sensors you know uh, from my childhood that i'm sure you had a similar experience with where you know in church where that that punishment that grand punisher element feels like something you want to avoid not you don't like i don't i don't like it <laughs> but yeah so was that well i mean you you could imagine the entirety of a human life from birth to death as one concrescence one actual occasion of experience and the perishing of that concrescence of of a complete human life um leads is what occurs at death right and then the moment of transition through the bardo to the uh the next concrescence that arises that inherits that is going to inherit the entirety of your life as one drop of experience you know mm. and so time <laughs> time's quite um relative in that in that sense from a whiteheadian point of view um that what seems like um a long time for every detail to be recorded or whatever is you know from another another point of view all occurring in a in a flash and many people do report my life flashed before my eyes you know before they die and so um but yeah these are these are very um speculative uh explorations and i'm not one who has had a near-death experience, but what is interesting to study that literature is how similar many of them are. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, Steiner is not, he didn't invent this idea. This is this is quite prevalent in many, um, many different traditions and in many um, reports from people. And, you know, you can ask the question, well, maybe they've all been primed in advance because of the popularity of this idea of a life review or whatever, you know, fair enough. Um, but I think a lot of the people who have had near-death experiences weren't studying this stuff before, and a lot of them weren't even spiritual. So it's not like, I don't know how primed they were um, to interpret it in those terms. But um, yeah, no, I, I know it's it's ultimately um, it is it is speculative, of course. And you know, when I was talking about looking at the anatomy of the heart, there was there was actually something that felt refreshing to me about um just 
just memorizing, you know, some names of par parts of a heart and being told their functions. And <laughs> they're like, did, you know, I, and I'm sure you've had, yeah, when, whenever you dip into something more like a hard science or something, there, there can be a, a, a relieving sense that there's something solid there that of course, you know, you'll get tired of that as well. And, and there's a balance to be struck, but, uh, yeah, no, you could you could take the heart out and measure it in a, in a cadaver, hopefully, and it's tangible. And um, natural science is such a gift uh, to our understanding of um, incarnate life, you know, because it does ground us in something that is um, observable by everybody. You don't need to have any special clairvoyant powers and whatnot. And so it's essential, I think, to, to do speculative philosophy, much less um, to cultivate etheric imagination or clairvoyance or what have you, you, it's, I think, really important, and Steiner agrees, to have a grounding in natural science first. So you know the difference between, um, you know, seeing what you want to see and actually perceiving something real. Um, to have that scientific attitude about it in advance of then you know leaping off of uh and or beyond the physical world into these other possible realities is really essential yeah well i, I feel like I'm, I'm in danger of making uh jumps that are too big because you know i sort of I, th there's plenty of philosophers that i have not read and reading whitehead and interpreting it as the um you know that that in some sense the conclusion is that the 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 experiencer is primary um it's it's yeah it's easy to take that and say well you know what i what grounding do i need if if the guys that were already grounded in mathematics and natural science took all of that information and eventually got to the conclusion that there's you know the indescri indescribable self at the center of it all well, maybe I can just comfortably sit here and, uh, you know, as if I've run the whole gamut already. Um, and yeah, I, I suppose I, I'm just looking for the, the proper framing for my own more um, systematic foray into the natural sciences and earlier philosophers and, and I, I want I want to catch up. I want to I want to have more of the information that you have because I do. I sometimes feel like, you know, I, I I get a quote here and there, and and I'll I'll be able to sort of gather the specific question that a, a philosopher was grappling with at a given moment and and get deep in the weeds in in a very limited way, but my I just have this little spotlight on some part deep in the weeds, whereas you know, you're, you're looking at the whole bush and, and, and can see it all and then zoom in. Um, and that I, I therefore often have to default toward this kind of grand speculation that um, there's nothing necessarily wrong with, but there's, there's some, there's some quality of, of substance, some like oomph, some, I can chew it, I can grab it, I can keep it factor that temperamentally um, can, can float away from me very easily. And I, you know, and I'm almost reassured what you said at the uh, beginning of the conversation, um, you know, the idea that all, all of this knowledge we accumulate, you know, we don't get to take it with us anyway, any of the specifics. I'm like, oh, great, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and my uh, my lack of investment there is worthwhile. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, no, on another level, one of the, re I mean, it's the, other than just, you know, a, a general feeling of calm and goodwill and wisdom that you exude, there's, the, the sheer volume of knowledge um, you're able to retain and, and the sources and the historical contexts, I, I, I'm, I really admire it. And it's, it's one of the main things I I'm, I'm trying to uh, imbibe from your, from these conversations. And, and I really appreciate your, your encouragement um, in that area. Cause I, I feel like I'm catching up. 
I mean, not that I'm, I don't feel like I'm catching up in the sense that like, I'm almost there, but I feel like the process of, of catching up um, has, has begun. Well, thanks Roman. This is enriching for me as well. And, um, you know, I don't want to disappoint you, but uh, it's not like, I feel like getting a PhD in philosophy is an exercise in the cultivation of my awareness of my own ignorance because there's just so much and I feel so behind and uh, overwhelmed by the number of old books that I still haven't read and new books that keep getting published that I need to read. And so um, it doesn't get any easier <laughs> as you go sure. along. The more you read, the more you know you don't know, really. Mm -hmm. So um, you just got to get used to that, I guess. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for another wonderful talk. Yeah. Enjoy our sessions, Roman. Thank you. All right. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care.